pleasure for me to be here with all of you and uh, appreciate the support of NEA, BPD, as always. Um, I've also been involved in some of the other conferences and always enjoyed them. Um, I was thinking about John's talk and the, the prevalence data in Norway of, of the avoidant personality disorder as the um, number one five percent prevalence. And it, it brought home the uh, degree of cultural influence on personality shaping. And I was telling Anthony when when I've been a visiting professor in uh, Norway, they're always very hospitable, good hosts. But when I'm speaking there and then I take a break, no one in the audience comes up to chit chat with me or ask questions. And I asked my host about that and he said, oh, that's the Norwegian way. We wouldn't come up and talk to the professor during a break. And I think this kind of rather shy, rather avoidant quality is uh, very significant. I would, I would say in, a, in the United States, as I recall, John, there was the, the study that was done, uh, I think it was part of the substance abuse survey that showed the highest in, was OCPD in the United States. And again, we're a driven culture to succeed, to be number one, and uh, you, you could imagine why that would be uh, a very high prevalence. So that's something to think about as we go through the day is what cultural influences there are. I'm going to talk about treatment data. And Peter, since we skipped the break, what time should we stop, 1030 or 1045? Okay. I may not have enough to get through an hour and 15 minutes, but we can do Q&A if necessary. Um, now, to start off with, um, John's presentation told us something very, very important, that borderline personality disorder is treatable. It's not a hopelessly chronic condition. And, you know, some of you may not appreciate this kind of a sea change in the view of the condition. Um, in the 1980s, I was asked to do a workshop on, this, on the subject of borderline personality disorder. I think it was uh, in the Twin Cities, in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And the sponsoring organization said, could we call it um, BPD the new chronic patient. And I said, no, we shouldn't call it that <laughs> because these people are treatable. And uh, they're not, quote, the new chronic patient. And I can remember a time when I was the director of the Menninger Hospital where we were visited by some managed care psychiatrists who wanted to discuss with us limiting the treatment of borderline personality disorder. And the cynicism was frankly alarming. They would say, why treat these people and spend all of this money when they're not really going to get better? And a lot of them just pretend to be suicidal anyway to try to get in the hospital. And there was a kind of contempt and cynicism that was uh, you know, deeply disconcerting to those of us who were committed to treating them. And I, I think then that there's been an optimism in the current climate of treating borderline personality disorder for the last, oh, 10 to 15 years. It's been um, really a huge change in the way we think and very, very important to give families and patients a sense of hope and optimism that this is something that can be managed, treated, and uh, master to a large extent. And so this is a, um, an important message for this entire conference today. As John said, when we worked in the APA practice guideline work group, we came up with a general statement that the optimal treatment 
is medication and psychotherapy. And the, uh, a large survey of, of the United States mental health practices several years ago showed that that's what most patients in the United States get anyway. The, the modal patient in psychiatric treatment in the United States gets a combination of medication and psychotherapy. It's the most common type of treatment. Another thing that we said is, as a conclusion, most patients with borderline personality disorder will need extended psychotherapy to attain and maintain lasting improvements in their personality, interpersonal problems, and overall functioning. There is no quick fix for this. You need to have somebody sit still long enough to really do some reflection on what's going on inside of them, what's happening around them. And that's the real key to the treatment. Lots of different approaches work, but you have to have somebody who will sit for a while and, and think about things. And, you know, again, we've had problems over the years with managed care thinking that, oh, there's got to be some brief treatment that will take care of this. Periodically, we'll hear that there's a miracle medication that's come, come about and it will fix everything very quickly. And, you know, the, the excessive optimism about medications has a long history. Osler, the famous physician, said uh, when a new drug comes out, use it quick while it still works. <laughs> and, we have to have a very modest view of what medication will do. And I always use medications in treating borderline patients, but I also make the point to the patient that it's the backbone of the treatment is going to be psychotherapy, and it's enhanced by using medication often. I like the way I look, but I hate my personality. <laughs> this is one of the things that we have to work on on always in the treatment of borderline personality disorder. What is it that distresses the patient about their personality? What do they want to change? What causes them difficulties? And this is not always immediately apparent. And a critically important factor in all treatment is the therapeutic alliance. You have to spend time with the patient deciding on what bothers them, what bothers other people that makes them want to change, and develop a kind of uh, treatment contract in which you know what you're going to be working on. And the reason to do that is so many patients with BPD feel sort of coerced into treatment. And they, they don't really want to be there, but they're doing it for someone else. And you need to spend time worth the patient deciding what they want to change. And, and, you know, sometimes the goals will change in the course of the treatment. You revisit them. I always uh, try to do a little bit of an assessment with the patient. How are, things, how are things going? Is this treatment helping you? Do you want to change anything about it? Do you want to rethink the goals? Making a collaboration, an alliance with the patient. Now, so far we have five psychotherapies where they've been shown to work in a randomized controlled trial. And at least one, the DBT has more than one. The, the importance here is that in psychotherapy research, the control condition has always been a problem and trying to decide what do you do with the control group is somewhat controversial in the field. In a long-term treatment, you can't simply put people on waiting lists and say, well, well, you wait for a year and we'll see how this treatment works. And uh, one of the things that uh, Peter Fonagy, John Gunderson, and I published in the archives a few years ago was a kind of uh, hierarchy of research designs for psychotherapy studies. And, you know, one of the, the best 
designs we can do is with a, a psychotherapy that's being tested against another psychotherapy that's empirically validated already to see you know what uh, what kind of outcome we get compared to a study that's uh, to a treatment that's already known to work and that's what these all involve here so that's that's why I say we have a group of studies now that show different types of therapy work. Now I'm going to take you on a brief overview of these therapies. Um, it's a little intimidating because the originator of mentalization based therapy, Anthony Bateman, is in the audience. <laughs> One time um, a man from what was the name of the famous flood in Ohio? Was it the Jones, uh, what, Youngstown or something flood? Huh? Johnstown. And what was the name of the flood? Johnstown. Johnstown's flood, right. Thank you. So a guy who'd been in the Johnstown flood died and went to heaven. And at the Golden Gate, um, St. Peter said, well, when you first get to heaven, there's a little meeting that takes place. And you tell about your life and what was particularly remarkable about it so people get to know you. And that guy said, oh, well, listen, that's no problem at all. I was in the Johnstown flood. I survived it. I'll tell everybody about that, and they'll be fascinated. And St. Peter said, you know, I should warn you. Noah is in the audience. <laughs> so I have Anthony Bateman in the audience talking about MBT, so I'm sure he'll be quite charitable to me in his reactions. I'm just going to cover a few of the findings here since he'll go over the techniques more. In the Hallowick Day unit, they looked at the effectiveness of psychoanalytically informed partial hospital treatment with routine general psychiatric care for 38 patients with BPD and utilized randomized control design. And one of the things that, that you'll see here is both individual and group were used. And I stress that because I've always felt that group psychotherapy is so valuable for borderline personality disorder, but often underutilized. Uh, sometimes clinics don't have the setup, or in private practice, people can't quite get a group going, but it's a marvelous modality. And I worked in the Menninger Clinic for 26 years where we routinely had groups, and I had an inpatient group with 12 borderline patients one time, and uh, I thought there was certain work that got done there that couldn't get done in individual treatment very well. And there was a... Um, uh, medication review by a resident psychiatrist, as you can see included in this. And by contrast, the control treatment was the regular uh, kind of treatment given. Uh, and what's obvious is no psychotherapy in this condition versus quite a bit of psychotherapy in the other one. That's why in the practice guidelines, we emphasize this as uh, a study of the show showing that psychotherapy was uh, effective. And in the uh, results, the partial hospital group had a clear reduction in the proportion of the sample with suicide attempts in the previous six months from 95% on admission to 5.3% at 18 months. So this is a dramatic reduction. This treatment really worked in terms of suicide attempts. Also, the average length of hospitalization in the co control group during the last six months of the study increased dramatically while it was stable in the treatment group at around four days per six months. Also, self-reported state and trait anxiety decreased substantially in the treatment group while remaining unchanged in the control group. So it also was dealing with symptoms other than self-harm uh, or uh, suicidal uh, thinking in the BDI, Beck Depression Inventory, the depression also improved. The score significantly decreased in the treatment group. So this is very important, and 
in, in general, the severity of the symptoms the patient had also decreased. So these were pervasive changes and not, not just in the area of suicidal or parasuicidal behaviors. Here's a, um, a nice graphic that Anthony and Peter had um, developed for their report, uh, the percent attempted suicide in the partial hospital group, which is the yellow uh, versus the uh, control group. And you can see there's a uh, huge difference, as I said earlier. Percent self-mutilating behavior also decreased. And here is the, um, the figure that shows uh, the last uh, part of the study I mentioned, which is namely that there was a huge increase in the use of hospitalization uh, by the control group from 12 up to 18 months. Obviously, a very important cost-effectiveness issue in this treatment is if you can keep people out of the hospital, then it's going to make a lot of sense to invest in outpatient non-hospital treatment from a cost-effectiveness standpoint. Um, when the Clinton administration, in their first year and two of office, were trying to develop health care reform, and you remember Hillary Clinton had a very complicated plan to do that, a group of about six of us were in Washington a lot lobbying to try to make this point about the value of treating uh, borderline personality disorder. And the only argument that held sway anywhere was, would it save money? And it sounds cynical, but that's the way Washington works. They were not interested to know that people are suffering, that people commit suicide, that families are devastated by the impact of this. They, you know, wouldn't bat an eye about that, but they would perk up if you said we can save money. And it had to be, the basis was outpatient treatment will save a lot of money in terms of inpatient dollars. So Anthony and his colleague Peter Fonagy reached these conclusions. The improvement in the psychiatric symptoms and suicidal acts occurred after six months, but a reduction in the frequency of hospital admission and length of inpatient stay was only clear in the last six months, indicating a need for longer-term treatment. Again, the point here is you can't do this in a quick-fix way. You've got to be patient, and you have to be in for the long haul. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, the partial hospital is a promising alternative to specialist inpatient and general psychiatric treatment. You know, one of the things that we encounter in this country is you cannot make partial hospital break even. I uh, used to go to a meeting called the Central Neuropsychiatric Hospital Association, and all of the private hospital directors would be in a room, and we'd go around the room. Nobody could make it pay for itself. And I think in the British system, you can get around that a little bit better than we can. And I, I think that that's one of the reasons this hasn't caught on as much in the States, because of the difficulty in uh, developing a cost-effective partial hospital program. Now, another very important point I wanted to emphasize about the MBT research, the treatment group not only maintained their gains, but they continued to improve twice weekly group therapy. Um, the control group showed only limited change during the same period. Uh, there are now a, about four studies with psychodynamically oriented treatments, not just to BPD, but other conditions as well, showing there's a, what we call a time release effect, that once you set therapy in motion, even after the formal termination, change continues to go on. And this is something confirmed clinically again and again that you internalize the therapist or therapists and continue with a kind of inner dialogue so that the treatment goes on and on and on and the patient uh, keeps working on the issues after the treatment ends. Now, um, the second 
therapy we'll take up is DBT or dialectical behavior therapy. This was developed by Marsha Linehan, of course, and has um, now, I believe, seven randomized controlled trials. The first was the one in Seattle that was published in the archives in 91, where there were 22 patients receiving DBT and 22 treatment as usual, and they followed these patients for 12 months. To give you an idea of how this structure is compared to the MBT structure at Halliwick, at least one, sometimes two individual therapy sessions, 50 to 60 minutes weekly, two and a half hours of group skills training per week. All therapists meet weekly as a group. Medication as prescribed and the telephone consultation is needed. The DBT does include the capacity to reach your therapist on the phone when needed. They showed a number of significant changes, reduced parasuicidal behavior, which means self-mutilation, self-burning, acts of self-harm that stop short of being suicide attempts, and the reduced medical severity of these acts, fewer hospital admissions, fewer psychiatric hospital days. So again, that effect of reducing inpatient. That one-year follow-up, the DBT patients had reduced the suicidal self-mutilating behaviors. They also had less anger, fewer inpatients, and better social adjustment than the controls. As I said, there are seven additional controlled trials, and DBT has been demonstrated effective by four independent research teams. And this is important, too, because it's a transportable therapy that doesn't require uh, one research team always doing it. Uh, a more recent study that's been received quite a bit of attention came out in the archives a year ago. And this was using a control group of experts in the community doing therapy the way they do it with one year of DBT. And they have 52 patients, and the community treatment by experts had 49. So larger N here. Now, they compared after one year, and the, the subjects who had the DBT rather than the expert treatment in the community had, were half as likely to make a suicide attempt, required less hospitalization for the suicidal impulses or thoughts, and had lower medical risk across all suicide attempts and self-injurious acts combined. Now, transference focus therapy is the third one we're going to examine. And we would call, broadly speaking, both mentalization-based therapy and transference-focused therapy, psychodynamic or psychoanalytically informed. This was developed by Otto Kernberg based on object relations theory. And the idea is that in childhood, we internalize a series of self and object relationships connected by an affect. Fairbairn of the independent group in uh, the British School of Object Relations said, we, you don't internalize an object. You internalize an object relationship. So there's always a self and an other. And to use neuroscience terms, they become representations in neural networks in the brain and are pretty durable. And these will determine a lot of your adult relationships. So the therapist then helps the patient see how past relationships that have, are internalized are constantly coming into the present and affecting the patient's relationships with the therapist in the transference and outside. Now, transference interpretation would be a major intervention so that you would tell the patient, you know, the way that you are relating to me now is like the way you related to a parent figure long ago or your romantic partner or boss or someone outside in the present. The, the timing of these transference interpretations, though, is critically important. And uh, you see a lot of misuse of this kind of approach by too much early 
aggressive transference interpretation that can actually make the patient worse. And we studied this at Menninger, a group of us who had audio tape transcripts of long-term therapy of borderline personality disorder patients. And often if the, if the way isn't paved for the interpretation of transference, the patient would deteriorate. And one humorous example of this was a friend of mine said to a patient, I think you are taking all of your anger towards your dad and projecting it into me. And the patient said, can you think of anything better to do with it? <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is an example of how the therapist is supervised by the patient. <laughs> All of us who do psychotherapy would say our best teachers have been our patients. They, they kind of help us get on track. So this is kind of a thumbnail sketch of the approach. And... Uh, in a recent editorial I wrote for the American Journal of Psychiatry, I headed it by saying, do all roads lead to Rome? Because the study done on this indicated that there are a number of therapies that work. What they did at Westchester and uh, Cornell was uh, 90 patients randomly assigned to one of three treatment groups, transference-focused therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, or supportive therapy, which I'm abbreviating SP, and this basically avoids transference interpretation and tries to offer support for adaptive, healthy defense mechanisms that uh, will appear and trying to help the patient uh, think more about what they're doing. All patients were given 12 months of psychotherapy with outcome measures at four-month intervals. So they did a lot of uh, assessment here. All three treatments brought about significant changes in multiple domains. Now, it's true that they were all effective. Transference-focused therapy seemed to be better than alternative treatments in some areas. The transference-focused therapy was associated with significant improvement in actually 10 of the 12 variables, and there were six symptom domains. And that compared with improvement of six variables with supportive therapy and five with DBT. Another important finding here that I thought was interesting, the areas of impulsivity, irritability, verbal assault, very important features of borderline personality disorder, and the TFP was the only one that brought about significant changes in those areas. Now, both TFP and DBT did better in reducing suicidality than supportive therapy. And that's significant because both of those therapies are specifically focused at reducing suicidality. So that specific focus seemed to matter. Subjects who received TFP were more likely to move from an insecure attachment classification to a secure one. Remember John's slide about near the end about an insecure attachment working uh, synergistically with a certain kind of endophenotype. And I'm sure when Anthony talks today, he'll mention insecure attachment as part of the mentalization uh, based therapy because we assume that impairments in mentalization grow out of insecure attachment. So part of a treatment like transference-focused therapy would be to help the patient have greater understanding of how their own subjectivity affects what they perceive in others, that they have one perspective, not the only perspective. And it helps them appreciate the other person's perspective so that that may be different than theirs. And this, of course, is uh, what we would hope for in uh, all therapy is improved mentalization. And, in fact, the study, the Cornell-Westchester study, did show significantly greater changes in mentalizing capacity in TFP than in the other two. Red is the TFP, and you can see the rating of mentalizing, which is 
used with an RF scale standing for reflective functioning was higher in TFP than either DBT or supportive therapy, indicating something that uh, I've heard Anthony say that most good therapies improve mentalization. Am I quoting you right, Anthony? It's not only mentalization-based therapy. Um, so we would say that in transference-focused therapy, like in mentalization-based uh, therapy, what you want is to improve mentalizing to have a clearer picture of self and other. I feel I'm losing touch with the unrealistic view I have of him. <laughs> this is what you want to happen in therapy. Um, I treated a woman with borderline personality who um, repeatedly uh, would pick out a certain kind of man who was narcissistic and often contemptuous towards women and she would, you know, have a horrible falling out in a few months and she kept, you know, going one after another of these kinds of men and eventually through long-term dynamic therapy she started to sense that she had an idealized unrealistic view of these men and managed to scotomize or not see a lot of the downside of these guys and finally uh, got involved with a, a very caring man whom they eventually got married and uh, have had quite a good marriage actually and I think this is what you hope will happen that the perception of self and other changes over time and in neuroscience terms we would say you don't the, the old ingrained neural networks don't disappear but they be superseded by new neural networks of self and other so that the old ones are relatively weak and the new ones relatively strengthened. Now, there are common elements in some of these therapies that I'm trying to emphasize here. Weekly meetings with an individual psychotherapist are in both MBT and DBT, one or more weekly group sessions, and very important here, meetings of therapists for consultation supervision. Um, some of you know that another area that I've written a lot in and uh, studied a lot is professional boundary violations. And, you know, one of the things that I see again and again in evaluating therapists who become way over involved with their patients is they try to be the Lone Ranger. They're in a solo practice. They don't seek consultation. They don't have any kind of um, supervision and they start deceiving themselves into thinking it's okay if I depart from the usual techniques here because I know what I'm doing and in this case the patient needs a specialized different approach and tragic things happen as a result of that uh, so I can't emphasize strongly enough that if you are treating borderline personality disorder patients you should regularly have some kind of consultation process. And uh, I've been uh, treating patients for 30 years, but I still use consultants, and I don't think I know everything. And I also know that our capacity for self-deception is extraordinary. And I could tell you examples all day of how people think they have a perfectly reasonable rationale for what they're doing, and it ends up going to hell in a handbasket. There's some common elements of transference-focused therapy and DBT. They both construct hierarchies of treatment priorities, and this helps you understand the, the approach that um, both DBT and TFB therapists would take. They would often begin by looking at, are there suicidal behaviors? And in the case of TFP, they would go to overt threats to treatment continuity, dishonesty or deliberate withholding, contract breaches, acting out in sessions, acting out between sessions, non-effective or trivial themes. So the therapist in this approach is directed to look at these issues in that order when they meet with the patient. Similarly, in DBT, you'd start out checking on the suicidal behaviors, then looking for behaviors that interfere with the therapy. 
because if you don't get to therapy, there's not going to be any treatment at all. And then behaviors interfering with the quality of life would be the third item in the hierarchy, and that, that gives a kind of focus to um, uh, the therapy. I, I think there's been a, um, a kind of stereotype of psychodynamic therapy often as, quote, non-directive. I don't think that's actually true the way most of us practice. Most of us are focusing on certain issues and directing the patient's attention to those, and this is one example on the TFP. Another common element that you'll see in uh, both dynamic therapies and the uh, DBT is some balance between validation of the patient's experience and encouragement to change. You really have to allow the patient uh, to explain their experience to you in a way that you can begin to understand it and validate it. And if a patient says to me, I don't trust you, and I hear about a series of authority figures or parental figures they couldn't trust in the past, I'll say, you know, I can appreciate why you wouldn't trust me, and I don't expect you to. I'll have to earn that trust. So that you have to validate while also helping them look at things from a different perspective. There's also cost effectiveness built into this, and that's another way that both the MBT and DBT are uh, similar. DBT saved $10,000 per patient per year because of reduced need for hospitalization. And in Anthony's uh, study on uh, MBT, the costs of the partial hospital were offset by less psychiatric inpatient care and reduced ER treatment. And then, as you can see from a 2003 report, the fo following discharge, the average annual cost of monitored health care for the treatment group was one-fifth that of the general psychiatric care group. And, you know, this shows something else, I think, too, that as we used to say in medical school, the head bone is connected to the neck bone, <laughs> meaning, you know, what happens in psychiatrically, emotionally, is going to affect the body and uh, the, the need to see other kinds of doctors. There are many patients who go from the gastroenterologist to the gynecologist to the internist to the family practitioner with a variety of complaints, and a lot of it has to do with their uh, emotional state. Now, a newer therapy on the scene is schema-focused therapy, um, and this uh, type of therapy was developed by Jeffrey Young for BPD specifically, and it's um, very much in the vein of cognitive behavior therapy. The therapist and the patient will look at recurrent patterns of patients' thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and develop an understanding of what those are, and then address them repeatedly, and develop strategies that are based on cognitive behavior ideas to deal with the patients. Four schemas typically distinguish BPD in this system. The detached protector, the punitive parent, abandoned, abused child, angry, impulsive child. Now, you can see immediately the similarity to what transference focus therapy would call internal object relations. Neural networks of scheme of self and other. And this, um, this also has a lot in common with DBT. In this study, 88 patients with BPD were randomized to either the schema focus therapy or transference focus therapy twice weekly for three years. So a little more individual therapy. And patients' assessments were made before randomiz randomization and every three months for three years. So it's a lot of assessments. In this three-year treatment, more of the schema-focused therapy patients were recovered or showed reliable clinical improvement, and they showed greater increases in the quality of life than TFP patients. Now, this was published in the archives and has um, also been a controversial study. Uh, Frank Yeomans, who was a consultant to the study, published a letter to the editor of the archives, and he questioned the findings because he said in the TFP group, those therapists were really not trained in TFP, that he had been a consultant who was hired to train them 
and he had very few meetings with them, and he said they were not sufficiently experienced and couldn't really adhere to the model, so that what was being tested was not truly transference-focused therapy, but their own model of dynamic therapy that they were using uh, after years of experience working with patients. So whether this, is, this uh, comparison is valid or not, um, you know, really raises a lot of questions. And, you know, just to take a pause here for a moment, when I say do all roads lead to Rome, I'm not only saying that there are five therapies that appear to help, I'm also giving a contemporary version of a well-known observation in psychotherapy research that usually it's hard to point to specific techniques within a psychotherapy as really what causes the change. And there are so-called nonspecific effects of all therapies that seem to be most important. And one of them that recurrently shows up is the therapeutic relationship or the therapeutic alliance, which seems to be perhaps the best predictor of how a therapy will go. So it could be that if you sit down with a borderline personality disorder patient and you go over a system, here is the rationale for, here's what we do, and the patient forms a good alliance with you, that that's the key ingredient here and a lot of different approaches can work. On the other hand, we've seen, as I went over that, there are some individual differences between therapies. It, but sometimes it's hard to sort out what really matters in terms of technique from what Freud called the narcissism of minor differences. And Freud pointed out when there are minor differences, for example, between countries or between neighboring states, Texas and Oklahoma, for example, <laughs> we exaggerate. <laughs> We exaggerate the differences to point out how the, the people across the border, isn't Oklahoma playing Texas today? Yes. It's good, it's good, good time to bring this up. You know, if you would go into the uh, stadium and interview the Oklahomans and the Texas fans, you'd, you'd hear that they greatly exaggerate the problems with the opposing team and the people who live in the opposing state. And in fact, there are rel relatively small differences, but we kind of um, develop group cohesion by identifying the <laughs> differences in people that are very close to us, you know, so that um, obviously this is one of the factors that goes on in large group dynamics and is relevant to psychotherapy research of this nature. I'm going to shift gears now and talk about pharmacotherapy for a while. And as I said, the standard approach nowadays recommended from John's uh, work group and practice guidelines is to combine medication and therapy. I uh, virtually always use medication when I'm treating a borderline patient. Um, I think the dosage needs adjusting. I'm not nearly as happy as the people in the ads. <laughs> you know... Um, this has been a huge uh, change in, in my career, <laughs> you know, as a psychiatrist. When we started getting all these ads, you know, on TV, we didn't used to see those for prescribed drugs. And patients come and say, you know, I saw this, you know, ad for Paxil or whatever or for Lexapro. And, you know, it looks like it probably works better than uh, what I'm currently taking. And can I try that? And I, I think there is an amazing influence of these, as uh, Madison Avenue was known for years. The uh, ads really do work. So, you know, to avoid just kind of a, um, an approach of, you know, which ad pleases you the most and which commercial on television uh, makes you want to take a particular drug, I think I, a better way is to use a target symptom approach. And this is what we did in the practice guidelines. This is not the same as the practice guidelines because that came out in 2001, and I've updated all of these categories in terms of uh, randomized controlled trials that have been done since then. But it's very, very useful to think affective dysregulation symptoms, like mood liability, impulsive behavioral symptoms, 
So there are lot, lots of impulsive behaviors that people get into, or cognitive perceptual symptoms, like transient psychotic thinking or depersonalization and uh, other kinds of distortions in perception. And I'll tell you one of the reasons I emphasize this. There's a lot of overprescribing for borderline personality disorder. And many, many patients are on four, five, six medications. And they come to see me as a consultant, and I have no idea which medication is doing what. So I, you know, it's, when you have that many medications on board, you just don't know what you're dealing with. So uh, one of the things that Paul Soloff, who was our medication expert on the practice guidelines, emphasized is make it very clear with the patient, again, back to the therapeutic alliance idea, what symptom you're trying to address with this medication and then track the results of that when you give one medication at a time. And sometimes it is useful to have more than one medication, but be clear on what you're trying to treat. There's, as you all know, there are a lot of primary care practitioners who see borderline personality disorder patients. And keep in mind, I don't want to sound like I'm bad-mouthing primary care doctors because they have an average of eight minutes per patient. And they may have to make a quick judgment and they think, this is depression. Oh, this is anxiety, and they give an antidepressant or anti-anxiety drug, and there isn't a very thoughtful, systematic way of approaching the symptoms, and over a period of a year or two, they then have the, the brown bag they come in the emergency room with that has seven or eight medications. So by thinking this way, I think we get uh, the most rational strategies for pharmacotherapy. And as you can see, SSRIs are probably the most widely used type of drug. They're often very, very helpful for mood dysregulation symptoms. And then next we go to low-dose atypical antipsychotic. Um, is this a pointer? Yeah. I want to call your attention to B. I put a little B there. Risperidone, olanzapine, aripiprazole. Those are three atypical antipsychotics. They all have placebo-controlled double-blind trials showing that they're effective in borderline personality disorder. Then, this is kind of like an algorithm in a way, because if the SSRI doesn't work, you would try an atypical antipsychotic. Then you might go to some of the mood stabilizer, anti-seizure medications like lamotrigine and topiramate. Both of those also have randomized control trials using placebos and double-blind design that show they are effective with borderline patients. Then you get down to a group called the benzodiazepines. You might try clonazepam. Note C here, do not use a alprazolam or Xanax as it may result in disinhibition. And this was shown early on in a study done at NIMH by Caldry and Gardner where patients became more impulsive when they took uh, Xanax or alprazolam. And this is very, very important because you often find that certain patients really like the feeling of alprazolam, but it doesn't help them. And those are two different things. Now, the next one here is, and by the way, just, just to make a comment here, clonazepam hasn't really been tested well with borderline personality disorder. Theoretically, because of the way it works in the brain, it could have disinhibiting effects. I don't know of any. I don't know if you guys have heard of any cases like that. Paul Soloff has used it successfully, and that's why we included it in the guidelines that most people have had pretty good luck with it without hearing about that kind of disinhibition. I've used it without any problem so far. Then we get down to the next group, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but these have to be used with considerable caution because of dietary restrictions. Um, and sometimes uh, I would not want to trust an outpatient with those unless I had a very good therapeutic alliance because if they became suicidal or self-destructive, they could certainly take that with wine or cheese and create quite a problem. Lithium is the same way. There's one study with modest sample size 
that showed it had some positive effects, but uh, it can be fatal in an overdose. So uh, lithium is pretty far down there. The, the other thing I'd say about lithium, there was a study published in the archives where um, they treated impulsive adolescents with lithium, and it actually helped, but nearly 50% had such bad gastrointestinal side effects they had to stop taking it. So, you know, it's not an optimal drug either from that standpoint of side effects. So these are pretty far down the list. If you look at impulsivity, SSRIs, again, are the drug of first choice, you know, the first line drug. Then you get the low dose atypicals again, risperidone, lanzapine, aripiprazole, although you have to be careful with weight gain on those, as you probably know, that's a major issue with the atypical antipsychotics and the metabolic syndrome. And then lithium, as I said, that has been tested in adolescent population as well as in one group of borderline patients, MAOIs. And then there's a little bit of data on valproate or Depakote and carbamazepine. Uh, now, those have some support, but not overwhelming support as, uh, a useful, as useful agents for impulsivity. Now, trex now, Trexone is used sometimes for self-mutilation, sometimes for alcohol abuse. And I don't think there's been a controlled trial. John, do you know if there has on naltrexone? I think it's used as an open-label drug just empirically to see if it works. Some people report decreases in self-mutilation. And certainly it's been around a long time with alcohol uh, abuse and may be helpful there. Now, Finally, we get into the last group, cognitive perceptual symptoms, low-dose atypical antipsychotics, like risperidone, olanzapine, aripiprazole. And um, sometimes those drugs can be used temporarily when you see a transient psychotic episode or psychotic-like thinking. Some patients with BPD benefit from having that all the time and not just transiently. And I've had some patients where every time I try to take it off, they get worse. But if I keep a low dose there, they do quite well. Um, and then SSRIs, of course. Now, obviously, a major point of scientific interest is why are SSRIs so effective? <laughs> There's a number of them. <laughs> Currently on Zoloft, Prozac, Paxil. Abuse bar isn't one, but... How long have you been on antidepressants? <laughs> Let me just show you a fascinating study that uh, Tom um, Rinna did, and John mentioned his work. Remember something that John said, that in those borderline patients, I should say those female borderline patients, because all the subjects were female in that study, who had chronic sustained childhood abuse, they had a hyperreactive HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And in this study, they took 30 of these patients and they gave them a test that's relevant to the HPA axis, this combined dexamethasone and corticotropin releasing hormone test, before and after fluvoxamine. Fluvoxamine isn't used as much in this country, but it's an SSRI. It's probably most widely used for OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And in this group, 17 patients had a history of sustained childhood abuse. 13 had no abuse history. Now, when they looked at this, both the six and 12 week fluvoxamine treatments were associated with a significant reduction of ACTH and cortisol response. So, it worked on the very axis that is abnormal in this group of patients. And the magnitude of the reduction is dependent on the presence of sustained childhood abuse. So I'm going to repeat something that John said. The problematic, the hyperactive HPA axis is not a sign of BPD. It's a sign of sustained childhood abuse, which is present in many borderline patients, but not all. Here's a nice graph of that. The top line here is the pre-fluvoxamine abused level. So the group of patients who had sustained childhood abuse before they got the drug, okay, and now 
if you look at this afterwards, the red group, post-fluvoxamine abuse. You can see it makes it, it brings them to normal controls and the, uh, the non-abuse, rather. And this makes a huge difference, showing the value of using SSRIs. Now, what this does, there's a decreased hyperactivity that facilitates mentalizing awareness of internal states and alters the relationship with the therapist. And I've seen this happen so many times clinically where a patient who is anxious and suspicious of me and does not trust my intentions tends to become a little more reflective, a little less suspicious, can think more, because if you're terrorized, think about a person who has had serious abuse history who doesn't know if the next person is going to be abusive or not. There's a hypervigilance, and that gets reduced. And in turn, then, the therapist countertransference is diminished when you're not being constantly challenged, scrutinized, but falsely accused, so that you can then relax a little bit, think more clearly, and then both parties have a, a better capacity to think and work, psycho, and work psychotherapeutically because the affect level goes down. And that's one of the reasons I say they're a good adjunct to psychotherapy, the, the SSRIs. Now, I, I want to, again, look at some of the science of this. I'm going back to some things John said about some of the research findings on the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. There is amygdala activation when you have emotionally aversive slides. That's part of the area that is hyperreactive in BPD. And there's also decreased volume of the amygdala. Okay, so over here we have some of the studies that have shown the decreased volume so that that's one of the things triggered in borderline patients when they are uh, not sure of your intent, what, what the therapist is wanting to do, and they become hyperreactive to small things. John also told you the prefrontal and orbital frontal cortex are the brakes on the hyperreactive amygdala. Now, another finding in borderline patients is this. There is smaller volume in the orbital frontal cortex, so maybe less regulatory activity here, less breaks, fewer breaks. And the yellow here is BPD. The blue is HC or healthy controls. And you can see the difference in the volumes here. So that's another reason that we have problems in the orbital frontal cortex and the uh, amygdala in BPD, the, the lower volume here. Now, there is a set of standard face, facial photos that Paul Ekman in San Francisco developed, which have been studied widely, and they have different expressions on them. Neutral, happy, sad, fearful, okay? You'll see that borderline personality disorder patients, because of this amygdalar hyperreactivity, overreact to these different expressions. And, you know, here we see borderline patients. Look at all the activity on these scans compared to normal controls. And they overreact even on neutral faces. They have a greater reaction, and they assume the therapist or the person is up to something, some kind of anxiety about malevolence or hostility, even with a neutral face. Now, I'm a dog lover, and those of you who work with dogs as therapists may need to use a different set of faces. <laughs> neutral, happy, sad, fearful. Now, if, if you're a basset hound lover like I am, you get to the point where you can discriminate these emotions. You may not be able to see them, but I can. I have three basset hounds at home, so. Now, back to amygdala hyperreactivity. Here again is what I was pointing out. Look at, in a neutral face, the borderline personality disorder reacts much stronger than the normal control, and of course, this is one of the reasons why we have difficulty in the therapy. Go back to what I said earlier in this talk. The therapeutic alliance is the best predictor of outcome in 
cross psychotherapy studies. If you approach the patient like you always do, with a neutral expression on your face, trying to be helpful, but the patient thinks you're up to something and has had a life that has confirmed that authority figures may not actually be benign, they're going to be very reluctant to develop a therapeutic alliance and collaborate with you because they're not sure why you're there or what you want from them. So this creates a huge problem right off the bat. Another way to state it is even in the normal therapist-patient relationship from the word go, it's a negative environment. There is a, a kind of perception of aggression, deception, malevolence that you have to deal with. Now this, I'll tell you how this comes up all the time. I run a, the outpatient clinic at the Baylor Psychiatry Department and uh, I have uh, about 12 residents and 10 psychology interns and about five social work trainees in the clinic and repeatedly every year this happens, someone will come into my office, one of the trainees, and they'll say, Dr. Gabbard, I don't understand. I'm, uh, this patient keeps accusing me of things. I'm just acting like I always do. You know, I'm just trying to be helpful. I sit there and the patient thinks, you know, that somehow I don't care about them, you know, that I uh, have some other agenda. And uh, I don't know what I can do to demonstrate, you know, that I'm uh, honest and reliable and they don't need to worry so much about it. And, and part of the problem, of course, is some therapists will start escalating demonstrations that they care. They may hug the patient, they may stop charging the patient, may extend the session as a way of saying, see, I really do care. And uh, this has, has been a problem, I think, in the treatment of borderline personality disorder, that you have to be willing to be in that role of the bad object and accept some of this aggression and try to understand it and not sort of depart wildly uh, in terms of your usual way of working with patients. So th th this is an important element in the treatment. And uh, I've been talking about a lot of brain parts here, and I wanted to just clarify you know, what exactly we're talking about. The, uh, the thalamus is that circled area right there. And here is the hippocampus, which also has lower volumes associated with amnesia and memory intrusions, okay? And then we have the amygdala right here. Now here is the prefrontal cortex, which regulates the amygdala. So I want you to see these brain areas so that you know kind of spatially what we're getting. And then the hypothalamus, of course, is underneath the thalamus. And uh, this area, remember, is lower volume, the, the prefrontal cortex. And this is relevant in one psychopharm study that came out of Germany. 10 BPD patients and three normal controls were compared. And what they did is they did PET imaging prior to 12 weeks of fluoxetine, and then that's Prozac, after completion of 12 weeks. Now what they found is that orbital frontal cortex area showed significant increases in the metabolic rate. That's just the very area that had the lower volume that we said the brakes weren't as intact in BPD patients. And fluoxetine had a normalizing effect on dysfunctional brain regions in BPD. So we can see again, why there might be a specific valuable effect of the SSRI uh, with BPD. So let me finish up here now, Peter, uh, just a couple of concluding slides. The obvious message today is borderline personality disorder is treatable. And it's best understood and treated without either or dichotomies of brain and mind. That's another message I've been trying to give you that, and John did too, that this is a mind-brain phenomenon and not something that's only of the brain, only of the mind, and the two, as if the two aren't connected. Treatment is cost-effective, and the medication and psychotherapy work synergistically to make changes in the brain over time. Thank you very much.